I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Oh, you've reached the mansion of Leaves of Glen. This whole mansion thing is a bit I'm not giving up. I'm invested in it 100%. You can hear the crackling fire. Uh, I'm all in on sound effects to allow you to believe that I live in a in a big house and not a tiny little shack. Uh, this is where I read the hottest in public domain books and short stories. This week, we're going to read or continue to read David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. It's his eighth novel, published in 1850, uh, which started out as a, a, a periodicals, whatever, uh, and was widely considered his most popular work. Let's find out when he was born, shall we? Uh, 7th of February, 1812. Hmm, that's interesting. What's more interesting, let's find out when he died, the 9th of June, 1870. And so I will continue on with uh, what I've been doing, for lack of any information about the author. Uh, That isn't just repetitive. Uh, Let's continue reading uh, The Unparalleled Necromancer, uh, which is a mental floss article, where we learn that he had a thing where he was into doing magic, uh, being a magician when he wasn't already a pretty famous writer. And he decided to play the character of some sort of... uh, uh, you know, Asian mystic, which is mildly racist, called Ria Rama Rus, and he wore a lot of big silks. The exact date of Ria Rama Rus' final performance isn't clear, uh, but it seems likely that it was sometime in September. That's notable. In front of an invited audience of friends and family. Not much of a show. Uh, Dickens dressed in a gaudy eastern robes and performed a selection of tricks including the Leaping Card Wonder, the Traveling Doll Wonder, and the climax of his act, according to his self-penned playbill, uh, the Pudding Wonder. Ah, I actually might want to see the Pudding Wonder. Sounds kind of interesting. Sadly, the Dickens family trip to the Isle of Wight was marred by tragedy when John Leach, a longtime friend of Dickens who had accompanied them on their holiday, got into trouble uh, while swimming in the sea and was crushed against the rocks by a wave. Oh, that's horrible. He suffered a terrible head injury that left him dazed and considerable pain for several days, which Dickens later uh, wrote... It is quite impossible to get him to maintain any one position for five minutes. It was like a a ship in distress in a sea of bedclothes. That's weird. Amazingly, when all the best medical treatments known at the time failed, Dickens used another of his conjuring hobbies to help nurse Leech back to health when he hypnotized him into a deep, recuperative sleep. When Leech eventually woke up, he was well on the road to a total recovery. That seems like... B.S. Uh, well, let's uh, recap what we read in the previous chapter, chapter 9. Uh, it's David's birthday. Well, that sounds fun and uh, delightful. But he gets pulled into the principal's office. Nah, that's not so fun. He was kind of thinking maybe he'll get cupcakes or something since it's his birthday. But nope, the principal tells him, uh, your mom's sick. Real, real sick. And there was kind of a long thing about that where they went back and forth. I mean, David asking how sick, what's wrong with her. And, and then he goes, ah, she's so sick, she's dead. And also that baby of hers died with her. And as I said earlier, didn't they have other options to feed the baby? If the mom dies, it's like, well, let's just put this baby in the closet because uh, no one's going to feed it. But apparently the baby died too. Uh, and then Clara spends the majority of her time with David after the funeral and everything, just kind of bragging about how she was there when uh, Clara died. So, that's pretty much it for that. Ah, crap. I still got more time left. Uh, Well, I hurt my butt bone. 
uh, helping move my sister and my brother-in-law into their place. I fell on my butt at one point as we were moving a bed and uh, got real sore. Found out that that bone, your butt bone, is also called, hilariously enough, your coccyx. So think about that. Uh, as I continue to read this story, thank God for the God, uh, the grandfather clock. Let's uh, dive into the story and uh, get this out of the way. You know, I do this every week. Uh, when Ben and I don't do a Book Boys episode, sometimes I do this twice a week. So, uh, you know, it gets a little mundane. I gotta change it up. Oh, you listeners. Oh, you want routine. You like babies. You want the same thing over and over, and you don't ever want it to change. So fine, I won't change anything. Will that make you happy? But for me, uh, I listen to the same public domain music that I've downloaded and put on this show. I need to spice it up. So this time, uh, I'm going to listen to different music, which I can't play on the show uh, because, uh, you know, licensing, and I'll probably get sued if anyone actually ever hears my show and decides to sue me. Uh, So you're going to hear the same music, but I, over here, oh, I'm going to listen to uh, The Four Horsemen by Metallica, just on repeat, over and over. And let's see if it gives the show a, a new kind of... Uh, a different kind of energy. Hey, well, you know, heavy metal music from the early 80s. We'll see what happens. Ah, there we go. Turned it on. Oh, that's loud. Loud. And uh, a lot of white angst. A lot of the kind of energy of a white college kid uh, punching drywall out of some sort of anger. Well, let's start with uh, chapter 10. I become neglected and am provided for. The first act of business Miss Murdstone performed when the day of the solemnity was over and light was freely admitted into the house was to give Peggotty a month's warning. Ah, what a jerk. Much as Peggotty would have disliked such a service, I believe she would have retained it for, for my sake, in preference to the best upon earth. She told me we must part and told me why. And we condoled with one another in all sincerity. As to me or my future, not a word was said or a step taken. Happy they would have been, I dare say, if they could have dismissed me at a month's warning. Too, I I mustered courage once to ask Miss Murdstone when I was going back to school, and she answered dryly. She believed I was not going back at all. I was told nothing more. Oh, you can't see that beautiful boy? The one he loved so much? I was very anxious to know what was going to be done with me. And so was Peggotty. But neither she nor I could pick up any information on the subject. There was uh, one charge in my condition, which, while it relieved me of a great deal of uh, present uneasiness, might have made me, if I had been capable of considering it closely, yet more uncomfortable about the future. It was this. The constraint which had been put upon me, was quite abandoned. Oh, I was so far from being required to keep my dull post at the parlor that on several occasions, when I took my seat there, Miss Murdstone frowned at me to go away. I was so far from being warned off from Peggotty's society that, provided I was not in Mr. Murdstone's, I was never sought out or inquired for. Now, at first, I was in a daily dread. I was taking my education in hand again. Or of uh, Miss Murdstone devoting herself to it. But I soon began to think that such fears were groundless, and that all I had anticipate uh, had to anticipate was neglect. I don't conceive that this discovery gave me much pain then. I was still giddy with the shock of my mother's death. Giddy with the shock of my mother's death? That's a weird way of phrasing it. Uh, I guess giddy meant something different back then. And in a kind of stunned state as to all the tributary things, I can recollect indeed to have speculated at odd times on the possibility of my not being taught anymore or cared for anymore and growing up to be a shabby, uh, moody man, uh, lounging an idle life away about the village 
as well as the feasibility of my getting rid of this picture by going away somewhere, like a, like a, ooh, like a hero in a story, uh, to seek my fortune. But these were transient visions, uh, daydreams I sat looking at, eh, sometimes, as if they were faintly painted or written on the wall of my room, and which, eh, as I melted away, left the wall blank again. Peggy! I said in a thoughtful whisper one evening when I was uh, warming my hands at the kitchen fire, yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Murdstone likes me less than he used to. Uh, he never liked me much, Peggy, but he would rather not even see me now if he can help it. Uh, perhaps it's his sorrow, said Peggy, stroking my hair. Uh, I'm sure, Peggy, I am sorry, too. If I, if I believed it was his sorrow, I should not think of it at all. But it's not that. Oh, no, it's not that. Uh, how, do you, how do you know it's not that? Said Peggy after a silence. Oh, oh, his sorrow is another and uh, quite different thing. He is sorry at this moment, sitting by the fireside with Miss Murdstone. But if, if I was to go in, Peggy, he would uh, be uh, something besides. Burp. What would he be? said Peggy. Oh, angry, I answered with an involuntary imitation of, of his dark front. If he was only sorry, he wouldn't look at me like he does. Oh, I am only sorry, and it makes me feel kinder. Peggy said nothing yeah, for a little while, and, and I warmed my hands as, as silent as she. Davy, she said at length. Hey, yes, Peggy. I have tried, my dear, all ways I could think of, all the ways there are and all the ways there ain't. In short, to get a ah, suitable service here in Blunderstone, but there's no such thing, my love. Hey, what, what do you mean to do, Peggy? says I, wistfully. Hey, do you mean to go and seek your fortune? Oh, I expect I should be forced to go to Yarmouth, replied Peggy, and live there. Ah, you might have gone farther off, I said, uh, bargaining a little, and being as bad as lost, I shall see you sometimes, my dear old Peggy. there. You won't be quite at the other end of the world, will you? Contrary ways. Please, God, cried Peggy with great animation. As long as you are here, my pet, I shall... My pet! Oh, she says it. That's a phrase I use all the time, and people keep telling me it sounds perverted and creepy. But they're saying this book, and it is in a loving manner. I shall come over every week of my life to see you. One day, every week, of my life! Exclamation point. Oh, I felt a great weight. Take it off. Why does it just peg it? Just take him to Yarmouth. I'm sure that the uh, Murdstones won't care. Uh, by mind the promise. Even uh, that was not all for Peggy went on to say, I'm a going. A dash going, Davy, you see to my brothers. First, for another fortnight's visit, just till I have uh, had time to look about me and uh, uh, to get something like myself again. Now, I have been thinking that perhaps, as they don't want you here at present, you might uh, be let go to go along with me. Well, there we go. They're doing like I said in this book. Glad to see the author is responsive. If anything, short of being in a different relation to everyone about me, Peggy accepted, uh, could have been given me a sense of pleasure. At that time, it would have been uh, this project of all others. The idea of being again surrounded by those honest faces, shining welcome upon me, of renewing the peacefulness of the sweet Sunday morning, with the, with the bells uh, ringing, the stones dropping in the water, and the shadowy ships breaking through the mist, of roaming nah, up and down with little Emily, telling her of my troubles, and uh, finding charms against them in the shells and the pebbles on the beach, made a calm in my heart. Uh, it was ruffled next moment, to be sure, by a doubt of Miss Murdstone's giving her consent, but even that was set at rest soon, for she came out to take an evening's grope in the store closet while we were yet in conversation, and Peggy, with a boldness that amazed me, Approached the topic on the spot. Ah, the boy will be idle here, uh, said Miss Murdstone, looking into a pickle jar. And idleness is the root of all evil. But, uh, yeah, to be sure, he would be idle here, or anywhere, in my opinion. Peggy had an angry answer ready, and I could see, but she swallowed it for my sake. It remained silent. Humph, said Miss Murdstone, still keeping her eye on the pickles. 
It is of more importance than anything else. It is of paramount importance that my brother should not be disturbed or made uncomfortable. I, I suppose I had better say yes. I thanked her without making any demonstration of joy, lest it should induce her to withdraw her assent. Couldn't he just go away? They don't want him or care about him. He could just literally run away and they'd never follow up on it. Nor could I help thinking uh, this a prudent course, since she looked at me out of the pickle jar with as great an excess of uh, sourness as her black eyes had absorbed its contents. However, the permission was given and was never retracted. For when the month was out, Peggy and I were ready to part. Oh, Mr. Barkus, oh, Mr. Barkus gets to be face to face with Peggy now. Came into the house for Peggy's boxes. Oh, yeah, he did. I had never known him to pass the garden gate before, but on this occasion, oh, he came into the house. Oh, and he gave me a look as he shouldered the largest box and went out. Yeah, he's putting on a show for Peggy, lifting heavy things, which I thought uh, had meaning in it. If meaning could ever be said to find its way into Mr. Barkett's uh, visage. Peggy uh, was naturally in low spirits at leaving what had been her home for so many years and, and where the two strong attachments of her life for my mother and myself had been formed. Uh, she had been walking in the churchyard, too, uh, very early, and she got into the cart and she sat in it with her handkerchief in her eyes. Now, uh, this is going to bode well for, uh, for Barkus. She's in a mood. So long as she remained in this condition, Mr. Barkus gave no sign of life whatsoever. Not good for him. This is not the time to, uh, to get aggressive. He sat in his usual place and attitude like a great stuffed figure. But when she began to look about her and to speak to me, he nodded his head and, yeah, and grinned several times. I have not the least notion at whom or what he meant by it. Uh, uh, it's a... Uh, it's a beautiful day, Mr. Barkus, I said as an act of politeness. Uh, it ain't bad, said Mr. Barkus, who generally qualified his speech and rarely committed himself. Peggy is uh, quite comfortable now, Mr. Barkus, I remarked for his satisfaction. Uh, is, is she, though? said Mr. Barkus, after reflecting about it with a sagacious, or sagacious, wow, I can't say this word. Something happened to my brain. I'm having like a mini stroke. Sagacious. There, I said it. Uh, Mr. Barkus eyed her and said, uh, Are you pretty comfortable? Ah, Peggy laughed and answered in the affirmative. Ah, uh, but really and truly, you know, uh, are you? Growled Mr. Barkus, sliding nearer to her in his seat and nudging her with his elbow. Are you uh, really a... Uh, Really, truly, pretty comfortable? Uh, are you? Uh, question mark. Well, that's pretty creepy. This guy's going to fail all over the place. At each of these inquiries, Mr. Barkus shuffled near to her. He gave her another nudge. So that at last we were all crowded together on the left-hand corner of the cart. And I was so squeezed that I could hardly bear it. Peggy, calling his attention to my sufferings. And Mr. Barkus gave me a little more room at once and it got away by degrees, but I could not help observing that he seemed to think he had hit upon a wonderful expedient for expressing himself in a neat, agreeable, and pointed manner without the inconvenience of investing conversation. He manifestly chuckled over it for some time. <laughs> That's pretty creepy. He keeps sliding in closer to closer to her, elbowing her, and then she's clearly uncomfortable, and he just goes, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and by and by, he turned to Peggy again and repeating, hey, are, you, are you pretty comfortable, though? Bore down upon us as before until the breath was nearly edged out by my body. By and by, he made another descent upon us with the same inquiry and the same result. At length, I got up uh, whenever I saw him coming in and standing on the footboard pretended to look at the prospect, after which I did very well. He was so polite as to stop at a public house expressly uh, on our account and entertain us with broiled mutton and beer. Did he get to have the beer? This kid's like nine. Even when Peggy was the act of, uh, in the act of drinking, he was seized with one of those approaches and almost choked her. Uh. 
but as we drew near to the end of our journey, he had more to do. And what, how did he almost choke her? Even when Peggotty was in the act of drinking, he was seized with one of those approaches and almost choked her. Okay, let's just move on with our lives. But as we drew near to the end of our journey, he had more to do and less time for gallantry. And when we got on Yarmouth's pavement, uh, we were all too much shaken and jolted. I pre uh, apprehended to have any leisure for anything else. Mr. Peggotty and Ham were waiting for us at the old place. Oh, they received me and Peggotty in an affectionate manner. I shook hands with Mr. Barkis, who, with his hat on the very back of his head, had a shamefaced leer upon his countenance and pervading his, his very legs, presented but a vacant appearance, I thought. Ah, uh, they each took out what a, uh, one of Peggotty's trunks, and we were going away. When Mr. Barkis solemnly made a sign to me with his forefinger to come under an archway. Uh, I, I say, growled Mr. Barkis, it was, it was all right. I looked up into his face and answered, with an attempt to be very profound. Uh, oh! It didn't come to an end there, said Mr. Barkis, nodding confidently. It was all right. Again, I answered, Oh, you know who was willing, said my friend. It was Barkis, and Barkis only. I nodded assent. That's all right, said Mr. Barkis, shaking hands. I'm afraid of uh, your... You made it all right first. It's all right. That made no sense. In his attempts to be particularly lucid, Mr. Barkis was so extremely mysterious that I might have stood looking in his face for an hour and most assuredly should have got as much information out of it as out of the face of a clock that had stopped. But for Peggotty's calling me away, as we were going, she asked me what he had said, and I told her he had said it was all right. Like his impudence, said Peggotty. But I don't mind that, Davy, dear. What should you think if I was to think of being married? Why, I uh, nah, suppose you would like me as much then, Peggotty, as you do now, I returned after a little consideration, greatly to the astonishment of the passengers in the street, as well as the relations going on before, the good soul was obliged to stop and embrace me on the spot. Really, that made people stop in the street and watch? with many protestations of her unalterable love. Now, now tell me, uh, what should you say, darling, she asked again when this was over and we were uh, walking on, uh, if you were thinking of being married uh, to Mr. Barkis, uh, Peggotty? Yes, said Peggotty. I should think it would be a very good thing, for then you know, Peggotty, you would always have the horse and the cart to bring you over to see me, and you would come for nothing. Ah, and be sure of coming. The sense of the deer, cried Peggotty. What have I been thinking of uh, this month back? Yes, my precious, and I think I should be more independent altogether. You see, uh, let alone my working with a better heart in my own house that I could in anybody else's now. I don't know what I might be fit for now as a servant to a stranger, and I shall always be near my pretty's resting place, said Peggotty, musing, and be able to see it when I like. And when I lie down to rest, I may not uh, lay it off far from my darling girl. We, neither of us, said anything for a little while, but I wouldn't so much as give it another thought, said Peggotty. Cheerily, if my Davy was anyways against it, not if I had been asked in church thirty times, three times over, I uh, was wearing out the ring in my pocket. Look at me, Peggotty, I replied, and see if I am not really glad, and don't truly wish it, as indeed I did with all my heart. Well... My life, said Peggotty, give me a squeeze. I have thought of it night and day every way I can, and I hope the right way, but I'll think of it again and speak to my brother about it. And in the meantime, eh, we'll keep it to ourselves. Davy, you and me. Barkis, that's nah, a good plain creature, said Peggotty. And if I tried to do my duty by him, I think it would be my fault if I wasn't, uh, if I wasn't, Pretty comfortable, said Peggotty, laughing heartily. This quotation from Mr. Barkis was so appropriate, it tickled us both so much, that we laughed again and again, and were quite in the pleasant humor when we came within view of Mr. Peggotty's cottage. 
It looked, eh, just the same. Except that it may perhaps have shrunk a little in my eyes, and Mrs. Gummidge was waiting at the door as if she had stood there ever since. All within the same, uh, down to the seaweed, to the blue mug in my bedroom. I went into the, uh, eh, to the outhouse to look about me. And the very same, not, oh, so it's not where you poop and pee. And the very same lobsters, crabs, and crawfish, possessed by the same desire to pinch the world in general, appeared to be in the same state of conglomeration in the same old corner. Yeah, I don't think they're pooping and peeing in an outhouse that has a bunch of lobs, er, lobster and crabs and stuff just sitting there. Uh, but there was no little Emily to be seen, so I asked Mr. Peggotty uh, where she was. Uh, she's at school, sir said Mr. Peggotty, wiping the heat consequent on the portage of Peggotty's box from his forehead. Uh, she'll be home, looking at the Dutch clock, in from uh, 20 minutes to a uh, half hour's time. We all in us feel the loss of her, bless ye. Mrs. Gummidge moaned. Yeah, cheer up, mother, M-A-W-T-H-E-R, cried Mr. Peggotty. I feel it more than anybody else, said Mrs. Gummidge. I'm a uh, not a lone, lorn creature. C-R-E-E-T-U-R. That again. And she used to be a most the only thing that didn't go contrary with me. Mrs. Gummidge, whimpering and shaking her head, applied herself to blowing the fire. Mr. Peggotty, looking round us uh, while she was so engaged, said in a low voice, which he shaded with his hand, the olden, from his rightly conjectured, uh, that no improvement had taken place since my last visit in the state of Mr. Gummidge's spirits. Now the whole place was, or it should have been, quite as delightful a place as ever, yet it did not impress me in the same way. I felt rather disappointed with it. Uh, perhaps it's because little Emily uh, was not home. I know the way by which she would come, and presently found myself strolling along the path to meet her. A figure appeared in the distance before long, and I soon knew it to be Emily. It was a, oh, a little creature, still in stature, though she was grown. But when she drew nearer, and I saw her blue eyes looking bluer, and her dimpled face looking brighter, and her whole self prettier and gayer, a curious feeling came over me that made me pretend uh, eh, not to know her. Eh, Passed by as if I were looking at uh, something a long way off. I've done such things since in later life where I am mistaken. Little Emily didn't care a bit. Oh, she saw me well enough, but instead of turning round and calling after me, yeah, ran away laughing. This obliged me to, well, to run after her. And she ran so fast that we were very near the cottage before I caught her. Oh, it's you, is it? Said little Emily. Why, you knew who it was, Emily, said I. And uh, didn't you know who it was, said Emily, as as I was going to kiss her. Oh, what the hell? But she was covering her cherry lips with her hands and said she wasn't a baby now. God, this has all got a weird kind of energy to it. It ran away, laughing more than ever, into the house. Oh, she seemed to delight in teasing me, which is a change in her. I wondered at very much. The, the tea table was ready. And our little locker was put out in its old place. But instead of coming to sit by me, she went and bestowed her company upon the grumbling Mrs. Gummidge and on Mr. Peggotty's inquiring why, rumpled her hair all over her face to hide it, and could do nothing but, uh, but laugh. Uh, a little puss, is it? said Mr. Peggotty. That's weird. Patting her with a, with a great hand. So shish is. So shish is, cried Ham. Master Davy Bore, so shish is. And he sat and chuckled at her for some time in a state of mingling admiration and delight and made his face a, a burning red. Little Emily was spoiled by them all, in fact, and by no one more than Mr. Peggotty himself, whom she could have coaxed into anything by only going and laying her cheek against his rough whisker. That was my opinion, that at least when I saw her do it, and I held Mr. Peggotty to be thoroughly in the right. But she was so affectionate, oh, and so sweet-natured, and had such a, a pleasant manner of being both sly, burp, and shy at once, that she captivated me more than ever. 
She was tender-hearted, too, semicolon, for when we sat round the fire after tea, an allusion was made by Mr. Peggotty over his pipe to the loss I had sustained. The tears stood in her eyes, and she looked at me so kindly across the table that I felt yeah, quite thankful to her. Ah, said Mr. Peggotty, taking up her curls and running them over his hand like water. Here's another orphan. You see, sir, and here, said Mr. Peggotty, giving Ham a backhanded knock in the chest, is another of them, though he don't look much like it. Yeah, if I, uh, if I had you for my guardian, Mr. Peggotty, said I, shaking my head, I don't think I should feel much like it. Well, said Master Davy boy, cried Ham, in an ecstasy. Hurrah, oh, well said. No more, you wouldn't. Whore, whore, <laughs> H-O-R, exclamation point, H-O-R. Here he returned Mr. Peggotty's backhander, and little Emily got up and, and kissed Mr. Peggotty. And how's your, your friend, sir, said Mr. Peggotty to me. Eh, oh, uh, Steerforth, said I. Eh, that's a name, cried Mr. Peggotty, turning to Ham. I knowed it was something in our way. You said it was uh, Rutterford, observed Ham, laughing. Well, reported, retorted Mr. Peggotty, and ye steer with a rudder, don't ye? It ain't fur off. How is he, sir? He is very well indeed. When I came away, Mr. Peggotty, ah, there's a friend, said Mr. Peggotty, stretching out his pipe. Ah, there's a friend, if you talk of friends, why, Lord, love my heart alive, if it ain't a treat to look at him. Yeah, he is very handsome, is he not, said I, my heart warming at the praise. Handsome, cried Mr. Peggotty. He stands up to you like a, like a, why, well, I don't know what he don't stand up to you like a, oh, he's so bold. Exclamation point. Yes! Exclamation point. That is just his character, said I. He's as brave as a lion, and you can't think how frank he is, Mr. Peggotty. And I do suppose now, said Mr. Peggotty, looking at me through the smoke of his pipe, that in the way of book learning, L-A-R-N-I-N-G, he'd take the wind out of a most anything. Yes, said I, delighted. He knows everything. He is astonishingly clever. There, so is Emily getting jealous now with all this talk going on? There's a friend, murmured Mr. Peggotty with a grave toss of his head. Nothing seems to cost him any trouble, said I. Oh, he knows a task if he only looks at it. He is the best cricketer you ever saw. He'll give you almost as many men as you like at draughts and uh, beat you easily. Oh, Mr. Piggy gave his head another toss, as much as to say, Oh, of course he will. He is, oh, such a speaker, I pursued. Emily's got to be jealous at this point, that he can win anybody over. Oh, and I don't know what you'd say if you were to hear him sing, Mr. Peggotty. Mr. Peggotty gave his head another toss, as much as to say, I, I have no doubt about it. And then he's such a generous, fine, noble fellow, said I, quite carried away uh, by my favorite theme, that it is hardly possible to give him as much praise as he deserves. Oh, I'm sure I can never feel thankful enough for the generosity for which he has protected me. Uh, so much younger and lower in the school than himself. Ah, I was running on, and I'm sure Emily is so jealous, or maybe disheartened, that clearly David is a man of men. I was running on in the very uh, fast indeed when my eyes rested on little Emily's face, which was bent forward at the table, listening with the deepest attention. Her breath held, her blue eyes sparkling like jewels, and the color mantling in her cheeks. Ah, oh, she looked so extraordinarily earnest and pretty that I stopped in a sort of wonder. And they all observed her at the same time, for as I stopped, they laughed and, and, and looked at her. Emily is like me, said Peggotty, and would like to see him. Well, that's not going to do well for David. Emily was confused by all of our observing her and hung uh, down her head, and her face was covered with blushes, glancing up presently through her straight curls and seeing that we were all looking at her still. I'm sure I, for one, could have looked at her for hours. She ran away and kept away until it was nearly bedtime. I lay down 
in the little old bed in the stern of the boat, and the wind came moaning on across the flat as if it had done before, but I could not help fancying now that it moaned of those who are gone, and instead of thinking that the sea might rise in the night and float the boat away, I thought of the sea that had risen since I last heard those sounds and drowned my happy home, I recollect, as the wind and the water began to sound fainter in my ears, putting a short clause into my prayers, petitioning that I might grow up to marry little Emily, and so dropping lovingly asleep. The days passed pretty much as they passed before, except that it was a, a great exception that little Emily and I seldom wandered on the beach now. Ah, she had tasks to learn and uh, needlework to do and was uh, absent during a great part of each day, but I felt that uh, she, uh, we should not have had those old wanderings, even if it had been otherwise. Wild! and full of childish whims, Emily's was, and she was more of a little woman than I had supposed. She seemed to have got a, a great distance away from me, and a little more than a year. Oh, and she liked me, eh, but laughed at me, and tormented me. And when I went to meet her, stole home another way, and was laughing at the door when I came back, disappointed. The best times were when she sat quietly at work in the doorway, and when I sat on the wooden step, at her feet, burp, reading to her, it seems to me at this hour that I have never been such, seen such sunlight as on those bright April afternoons, that I have never seen such a sunny little figure as I used to see sitting in the doorway of the old boat, that I have never beheld such sky, such water, such glorious uh, ships sailing away into the golden air. On the very first evening after our arrival, Mr. Barkus appeared in an exceedingly vacant and awkward condition, with a bundle of oranges eh, tied up in a handkerchief. Well, he's going back. He's giving another shot. He feels despondent, and he comes bearing gifts. Oranges is not really a gift that invites love. You buy chocolate and alcohol. Uh, as he made no illusion... Of any kind to this propriety, he was supposed to have left it behind him by accident when he went away until Ham, running after him to restore it, came back with the information that it was intended for Peggotty. After that occasion, he appeared every evening at exactly the same hour. That seems a little desperate, a little thirsty, and always with a, with a little bundle. Yeah, pretty thirsty. To which he never alluded and was regularly put behind the door and left there. Burp. These offerings of affection were a most various and uh, eccentric description. Among them, I remember a double set of uh, pig's trotters. What? Like the feet of a pig? A huge pincushion, half a bushel or so of apples, and a pair of jet earrings. Uh, some Spanish onions. A box of dominoes. A canary bird in a cage. Wow. And a leg of pickled pork. <laughs> these gifts are across the map. <laughs> I love these. Like, I don't know what she likes, so I'm going to canvas the entire area. I'm going to have parts of pigs, a pin cushion, more apples, uh, Spanish onions, earrings? What's a jet earring? Let's look that up. Ah. Oh, they're just weird black earrings. That's weird. Okay. They're just some sort of black metal. I don't know what the heck that is. A stone? Well, whatever. It's probably the nicest thing out of all this stuff that he got her. But uh, he's canvassing an area and good for him. Mr. Barkus's wooing, as I remember it, was altogether of a peculiar kind. He was very seldom said uh, eh, anything, but would sit by the fire in much the same attitude as he sat in his cart and stare heavily at Peggotty, who was opposite. <laughs> Oh, that's so creepy. First of all, he keeps showing up uninvited, bringing gifts. It does, you know, which is which are weird for the most part. Uh, and then when he does just sit there and he won't leave, he just stares at Peggotty. One night, being, as I suppose, inspired by love, he made a dart at the bit of wax candle she kept for her thread and uh, put it in his waistcoat pocket and carried it off. That's weird. Is that the same kind of gesture as if you just like pluck a hair off her head and then go running out of the room? 
Uh, after that, his great delight was to produce it uh, when it was wanted, sticking to the lining of his pocket in a uh, partially melted state and pocketed it again when it was done with. He seemed to enjoy himself very, he seems obsessive, uh, very much, and not to feel at all called upon to talk. Even when he took Peggotty out for a walk on the flats, he had no uneasiness on that, uh, uh, on that head, I believe, contenting himself with now and then asking her if she was uh, pretty comfortable. <laughs> like in the cart. He can only talk to people in relation to driving them. Uh, and I remember that sometimes after he was gone, Peggy would throw her apron over her face all this again and laugh for half an hour. Oh, Lord. Indeed, we were all more or less amused, except that miserable Mrs. Gummidge, whose courtship would appear to have been of an exactly unparalleled nature, would was so continually reminded by these transactions of the old one. Eh, oh, boy. At length, when the term of my visit was nearly expired, it was given out that Peggotty and Mr. Barkis were going to make a day's holiday together. How does this happen with this creepy, weird, quiet man? And that little Emily and I were to accompany them. Weird. And I had but a broken sleep the night before, in anticipation of the pleasure of a whole day with Emily. Oh, we were all astir uh, bedtimes in the morning, and while we were... Yet at breakfast, Mr. Barkis appeared in the distance, driving a chaise cart toward the object of his affections. Peggotty was dressed as usual in her neat and quiet morning, but Mr. Barkis bloomed in a new blue coat, of which the tailor had given him such good measure that the cuffs would have rendered gloves unnecessary in the coldest weather, while the collar was so high that it pushed his hair up on the end on the top of his head, and with his bright buttons, too, were of the largest size, rendered complete by drab p pantaloons and a, and a buff waistcoat. I thought Mr. Barkis a phenomenon of respectability. Well, with that, let's take a break. Let's retire into the... And to the boudoir, <laughs> where you and I will uh, have a moment of uh, intimacy. Ah, here we are, in my master bedroom. Oh, what are you wearing? A, a little silky outfit? What do you think we're just going to... Have a normal interaction with each other? No! I want to get things crazy. I want to get things uh, kind of dangerous. Put on this leather jacket and nothing else. As I read to you uh, the newest upcoming romance novel, The Velocity of Revolution by Marshall Ryan Maresca. Uh, from the author... Of the Meridane saga, oh boy, comes a new steampunk fantasy novel that explores a chaotic city on the verge of revolution. Zapier, a city being rebuilt after years of mechanized and magical warfare, the capital of a ravaged nation on the verge of renewal and self rule. But unrest forments as Undercast cycle gangs raid supply tracks, agitate the populace, and vandalize the city. Oh, a revolution is brewing in the slums and shanty towns against the occupying government, led by a voice on the radio, connected through forbidden magic. Went the, uh, Tungit? A talented cycle rider and loyal officer of the city patrol is assigned to infiltrate the cycle gangs. For his mission against the insurgents, Wenthe must use their magic, uh, connecting his mind to uh, Na Nalia. It's got like a schwa in there somewhere. A recently captured rebel using her knowledge to find his way into the heart of the rebellion. Wenthe's skill on a cycle makes him valuable to the resistance cell he joins, but he discovers the magic enhances with speed. Every ride intensifies his connection, drawing him closer to the gang he must betray, and strengthens Nalia's presence as, he, as she haunts his mind. Wenthe is torn between justice and duty, and the wrong choice will light a spark in a city on the verge of combustion. 
Well, that sounds hot. <laughs> At what point, with all this motorcycle riding in some sort of apocalyptic city, does uh, romance happen? I have no idea. Doesn't matter. It's uh, the category of urban fantasy and romance, and apparently steampunk. So, I guess all their motorcycles are steam-powered. A lot of steam coming out the back. That's weird. They gotta they keep shoveling coal into the engine while they're riding it. I have no idea. It comes out February 9th, uh, 2021, for 17 bucks. So, if you want to get, uh, get wet while reading a book about motorcycles in an apocalyptic city, uh, be sure to pick up The Velocity of Revolution by Marshall Ryan Mascara. Well, that was a dud. Uh, let's just say I'm not uh, worked into a lather anymore like I was previously, so we'll just give this up and go back into the library and continue reading the rest of this chapter. Ah, go on. Nestle into this uh, big, comfy, naugahyde chair that I have going on here in the library as I continue to read from you a, a chapter 10 of this book. When we were all in a bustle outside the door, I found that Mr. Peggotty was prepared with an old shoe, which was to be thrown after us for luck. That's weird. Which he offered to Miss Gummidge for that purpose. No! It had better be done by somebody else. I, uh, Daniel, said Mrs. Gummidge. I am lone, torn creature myself. And uh, here she goes, bringing everybody down. Burp and everything that reminds me of creatures that ain't lone, lone and lorn. Burp goes contrary with me. Come, old gal, said Mr. Peggotty. Take it, yeah, and heave it. No, Daniel, returned Mrs. Gummidge, whimpering and shaking her head. If I felt less, I could do more. Uh, you don't feel like me, Daniel. Things don't go contrary with you, nor you with them. You you had better eh, do it yourself. But here, Peggotty, who had been going about from uh, one to another in a hurried way, ah, kissing everybody, uh, called out from the cart, in which we are all by this time. Uh, Emily and I were on two little chairs side by side. Th this is impossible to read. This is one paragraph right now with no periods and a lot of parentheses and stuff, uh, that Mrs. Gummidge must do it. So Mrs. Gummidge did it. And I am sorry to relate, cast a damp upon the festive character of our departure, of course, because that's what she's all about, by immediately bursting into tears, oh boy, and sinking subdued in the arms of Ham, with the declaration that she knowed she was a burden and had better be carried into the house at once, which I readily thought was a sensible idea, and that Ham uh, might have acted on. Away we went, uh, however, on our holiday excursion, and the first thing we did was to stop at a church. Ugh. Barkus has no idea how to date somebody. Where Mr. Barkus tied the horse to some rails and, and went in with Peggotty, leaving little Emily and me alone in the, in the chase. I took that occasion to... Eh, put my arm around Emily's waist and proposed that as I was going away so very soon now, we should determine to be very affectionate to one another and, and very happy all day. That's weird. Little Emily's consenting and allowing me to, ah, to kiss her. I became desperate, informing her, I recollect, that I would, could never love another and that uh, I was prepared to shed the blood of anybody who should aspire to her affections. This is weird. So the two go into the church, and then he slides his arm around her waist and goes, we should spend the day being real, real nice to each other. You know what I'm saying? And winks at her, and she's like, all right, I'm on board. And then he's like, I will kill anyone <laughs> who tries to get to you. How merry little Emily made herself about it, exclamation point, with what a demure assumption of being immensely older and wiser than I. The fairy little woman said I was a, quote, silly boy, and that we laughed so charming that I forgot the pain of being called uh, by that a despairing name in the pleasure of looking at her. Oh, Mr. Barkus and Peggotty were a good while in the church. The epic came out at last. What are they doing in there? And then we drove away into the country as we were going along. Mr. Barkus turned to me and said, uh, with a wink, by the by, 
that I should hardly have thought before that we could think, or could wink. Uh, what name was it as I rode up in the cart? Claire Peggotty, I answered. What name would it be as I should write up now if there was a tilt here? The hell's going on? Clara Peggotty again, I suggested. Clara Peggotty Barkis, he returned and burst into a roar of laughter that shook the chase. In a word, they were married. That's really? <laughs> so he spends weeks showing up, dropping off, an array of gifts to cover a wide canvas, sitting quietly staring at Peggotty by the fire and not speaking to her, going out for walks with her and only asking cart-related questions like, are you comfortable while she's walking? So it's just like this weird broken sim. And then uh, they go out on their first real date and they bring kids, and then they just get married right there on the spot. This is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. In a word... They were married and had gone to the church for no other purpose. Peggotty was resolved that it should, it should be quietly done, and the clerk had given her away, and there had been no uh, witnesses of the ceremony. Uh, she was a little confused when Mr. Barkus made this abrupt announcement of their union and could not hug me enough in token of her unimpaired affection. But she soon became herself again and said she was uh, very glad it was over. We drove to a little inn in a by-road, uh, where we were expected, and where we were very comfortable, uh, had a very comfortable dinner, and passed away the day of great satisfaction. If Peggotty had been married every day for the last ten years, she would hardly have been more at her ease about it. It made no sort of difference to her. Uh, she was just the same as ever, and went out for a stroll with little Emily, and me before tea, while Mr. Barkus philosophically smoked his pipe and enjoyed himself, I suppose, with the contemplation of his happiness. If so, that sharpened his, his appetite. Uh, for I distinctly called to mind, although he had eaten a good deal of pork and greens at dinner and had finished off uh, with a fowl or two, he was obliged to have a cold boiled bacon for tea and disposed of a large quantity without any emotion. That whole thing was weird. He had bacon for tea? Whatever. I have often thought since what an odd, innocent, out-of-the-way kind of wedding it must have been! Exclamation point. We got into the chase again soon after dark and drove cozily back, looking up at the, at the stars and talking about them. I was their chief exponent and opened uh, Mr. Barkus's mind to an amazing extent. I told him all I knew, but he would have believed anything I might have taken into uh, my head to impart to him, for he had a profound veneration for my abilities, and informed his wife in my hearing on that very occasion that I was a young Rosas, by which I think he meant prodigy. When we had exhausted the subject of the stars, or rather when I had exhausted the mental faculties of Mr. Barkus, little Emily and I made a cloak of an old wrapper, and I sat under it for the rest of the journey. Ah, how I loved her. What happiness, parentheses, I thought, if we were married and were going away, anywhere to live among the trees in the fields, never eh, growing older. Never growing wiser. Children, ever, rambling hand in hand through the sunshine and among the flowery meadows, lying down our heads on moss at night in a sweet sleep of purity and peace, and buried by the birds when we were dead! Exclamation point. Some such creature, a picture, <laughs> with no real world in it, uh, bright with the light of our innocence and vague as the stars afar off, was in my mind all the way. I am glad to think that there were two such guileless hearts at Peggotty's marriage as little Emily's and I. I am glad to think the loves and graces took such airy forms in its homely possession. Well, we came to the old boat again in good time at night, and there Mr. and Mrs. Barkis bade us goodbye and drove away snugly to their own home. Where's their own home? Barkus's home? What's that got to look like? I want to know what Barkus's home looks like. It's got to be pretty terrifying. I felt then, for the first time, that I had lost Peggotty. I should have gone to bed with a sore heart indeed under any other roof but that which sheltered little Emily's head. Mr. Peggotty and Ham knew 
what was in my thoughts as well as I did, and were ready with some supper, uh, their hospital faces, hospital, hospitable faces to drive it away. Little Emily came and sat beside me on the locker for the only time in all that visit, and it was altogether a wonderful, uh, close to a wonderful day. It was a ah, night tide, and soon after we went to bed, Mr. Peggotty and Ham went out for fish. I felt very brave at being left alone in the solitary house and uh, protector of Emily's and Mrs. Gummidge, and only wished that a lion or a serpent or any ill-disposed monster would make an attack upon us, that I might destroy him and cover myself with glory. Uh, but as nothing of the sort happened to be... Walking about on Yarmouth Flats that night, I provided the best substitute I could for dreaming of dragons until morning. With morning came Peggotty, who called to me, eh, as usual, under my window as if Mr. Barkis the carrier had been from first to last a dream, too. After breakfast, eh, she took me to her own home. Oh, here we go. And a beautiful little home it was, was it? Of all the movables in it, I must have been impressed by a certain old bureau of some dark wood in the parlor. Eh, the tile-floored kitchen was a general sitting room, in parentheses, which a retreating top, which opened, let down, and became a desk, within which was a large quattro edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs. This precious volume, of which I do not recollect one word, I immediately discovered and immensely applied myself to and never visited the house afterwards, but I kneeled on a chair, opened the casket where this gem was enshrined, uh, spread my arms over the desk, and fell to devouring the book of fresh. I was chiefly edified, I am afraid, by the pictures, which were numerous and represented all kinds of dismal horrors, but the martyrs in Peggotty's house have been inseparable in my mind ever since and are now. Well, I took leave of Mr. Peggotty and Ham and Mrs. Gummidge and the Lamley that day and passed the night at Peggotty's in a little room in the roof, uh, parentheses, with the crocodile book on a shelf by the bed's head. Oh, that's cute. Which was to be always mine. Peggotty said and, and should always be kept for me in exactly the same state. Yeah, young or, young or old, Davy dear, as long as I am alive and have this house over my head, said Peggotty, you shall find it as if I expected you were directly a uh, minute. I shall keep it every day as I used to keep your old little room, my darling, as if you was to go to China. You might think of it as being kept just the same all the time you were away. I felt the truth consistency of my old dear nurse with all my heart and thanked her as well as I could. Uh, that was not very well, for she spoke to me thus, with her arms around my neck. This is weird. In the morning, and I was going home in the morning, and I, and I went home in the morning uh, with herself and Mr. Barkis in the car. They left me at the gate, not easily or lightly, and it was a strange sight uh, to me to see the cart go on, taking Peggotty away and leaving me under the old elm trees looking at the house in which there was no face to look on mine with love or liking any more. And now I, I fell to a state of neglect which I cannot look back upon without compassion. I fell at once into a ah, solitary condition, apart from the friendly notice, apart from the society of all of the boys my own age, apart from the all-companionship, but my own spiritless thoughts, which seems to cast its gloom upon this paper as I write. What... Would I have given uh, to have been sent to the hardest school that was ever kept to have been taught something? Anyhow, anywhere, no such hope dawned upon me. They disliked me, uh, and they sullenly, sternly, steadily, and overlooked me. I think Mr. Murdstone's means were straightened uh, at about this time, but it was little to the purpose. He could not bear me. And in putting me from him, he tried, as I believe, to put away the notion that I had any claim upon him, and it succeeded. Wait, they dropped him back off at the mansion? With the Murdstones? Is that what's happening right now? I was not actively ill-used. I was not beaten or starved. But the, the wrong that was done to me had no intervals of relenting, and was done in a systematic, passionless manner. 
Now, day after day, week after week, and month after month, I was coldly neglected. I I wonder sometimes, when I think of it, uh, what they would have done if I had been taken with an illness, whether I should have lain down in my lonely room and languished through it in my usual solitary way, or whether anybody would have helped me out. When Mr. and Mrs. Murdstone were home, I took my meals with them. In their absence, I I ate and drank by myself. At all times, I lounged about the house and neighborhood quite uh, disregarded, except that they were eh, jealous of my making any friends, uh, thinking perhaps uh, that if I did, I might complain to someone. Uh, For this reason, though, Mr. Chillip often asked me to go and see him, parentheses, he was a widower, having some years before that, lost little, a uh, small, light-haired wife, whom I can just remember connecting with my own thoughts with a pale tortoiseshell cat. It was but seldom that I enjoyed the happiness of passing an afternoon in his closet of surgery, reading some book that was new to me, with the smell of the whole pharmacopoeia coming up my nose or, or pounding something in a mortar under his mild directions. Uh, for, for the same reason, added no doubt to the old dislike of her, I was seldom allowed to visit Peggotty. Faithful to her promise, she either came to see me or meet me somewhere near once every week, and I never empty-handed, but many and bitter were the disappointments I had in being refused permission to pay a visit to her at the house. Some few times, however, at long intervals, I was allowed to go there, and uh, then I found out that Mr. Barkis was something of a miser, or as Peggy dutifully expected, was a, a, quote, a little near, and kept a heap of money in a box under his bed, which he pretended was only full of coats and trousers. Uh, in this coffier, his riches hid themselves with such a tenacious modesty that the smallest installments could only be tempted out by artifice, so that Peggotty had to prepare a long and elaborate scheme. A very gunpowder plot for every Saturday's expenses. All this time I was so conscious of the waste of any promise I had given, and of my being utterly neglected that I should have been perfectly miserable. Oh, I had no doubt But for the old books, they were my only comfort, and I was as true to them as they were to me, and read them over and over. I don't know how many times more. I now approach a period of my life, which I can never lose the remembrance of, while I remember anything, and the recollection, which has often, without my uh, invocation, come before me like like a ghost and haunted happier times. Oh, I'd I'd been out one day, loitering somewhere in the listless, meditative manner uh, that my way of life engendered, when when turning to the corner of a lane near our house, I came upon Mr. Murdstone, walking with a gentleman. Oh, I was confused. It was going by them when the gentleman cried, "Uh, What? Brooks? No, sir. David Copperfield, I said. Oh, don't tell me. You are Brooks, said the gentleman. You are Brooks of Sheffield. That's your name. At these words, I observed the gentleman more attentively. His his laugh coming to my, remem- my remembrance, too. I knew him to be Mr. Quinnon, whom I had gone over to low, lowest loft with Mr. Murdstone to see before. It was no matter. I need not recall when. And how do you uh, get on? "'And where are you being educated, Brooks?' said Mr. Quinnon. "'Oh, he had put his hand upon my shoulder and turned me about to walk with them. "'I did not know what to reply, but glanced dubiously at Mr. Murdstone. "'Burp. He is at home at present,' said the latter. "'He's not being educated, uh, anywhere. "'I don't know what to do with him. Ah, "'It's a difficult subject. "'That old double look was on me for a moment.' And then his eyes darkened with a frown, as it turned in its aversion elsewhere. Humph, said Mr. Quinnon, looking at us both. I thought, ah, fine weather. Silence ensued, and I was considering how I could best disengage my shoulder from his hand and go away, when he said, Ah, I suppose you're a, a pretty sharp fellow still, eh, Brooks? Aye. Is sharp enough, said Mr. Murdstone impatiently. You had better let him go. He will not thank you for troubling him. 
On this hint, Mr. Quinnon released me, and I made my best of my way home, looking back as I turned into the front garden. I saw uh, Mr. Murdstone leaning against the wicket of the churchyard, and Mr. Quinnon talking to him. They, they were both looking after me, and I felt uh, that they were speaking of me. Oh, Mr. Quinnon lay in our house that night after breakfast the next morning, and I had put my chair away and was going out of the room when Mr. Murdstone called me back. He then gravely repaired to another table where his sister sat herself at her desk. Mr. Quinnon, with his hands in his pockets, uh, stood looking out the window, and I, I stood looking, looking at them all. David, said Mr. Murdstone, to the young, this is a world for action, not for moping and droning in, as you do, added his sister. Jane Murdstone, leave it to me, if you please. I say, David, to the young, this is a world of action, and not for moping and droning in. It is especially so for a, a young boy of your disposition, which requires a great deal of correcting and to which no greater service can be done than to force it to conform to the ways of the working world and to bend it and break it. For stubbornness won't do here, said his sister. What it wants is to be crushed, and crushed it must be, shall be too. Oh, he gave her a look, half in remonstrance, half in approval, and went on. I suppose you know, David, that I am not rich. No, because he sucked up his mom's money. At any rate, you know it now. You have received some considerable education already. Education, oh, is costly. And even if it were not, and I could afford it, I am of opinion that it would not be at all advantageous uh, to you to be kept at school. What is before you is a fight with the world. And the sooner you begin it, oh, the better. I think it occurred to me that I had already begun it in my poor way, but it occurs to me now whether or no. You have heard the counting house mentioned sometimes, said Mr. Mosta, Mr. Murdstone. Yeah, the counting house, sir, I repeated. Of Murdstone and Grinby in the wine trade, he replied. I suppose I looked uncertain, for he went on hastily. You have heard the counting house mentioned, or the business, or the cellars, or the wharf, or uh, eh, something about it. I think I've heard the business mentioned, sir, I said, replying, remembering uh, what I vaguely knew of his and his sister's resources. But I, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know when. Oh, it does not matter when, he returned. Mr. Quidon manages that business. I glanced at the latter deferentially as he stood looking out of the window. Mr. Quinnon suggests that it gives employment to some other boys and that he sees no reason why it shouldn't, on the same terms, give employment uh, to you. He having, Mr. Quinnon observed in a low voice and half turning round, no other prospect, Murdstone. Mr. Murdstone, with an impatient, uh, even angry gesture, resumed without noticing what he had said. Those terms are that you will earn enough for yourself to provide for your eating, uh, drinking, and uh, pocket money. Oh, your lodging, which I have arranged for in parentheses, will be paid by me. So will your washing, dash, and then another dash, which will be kept down to my estimate, said his sister. Your clothes will be looked after for you, too, said Mr. Murdstone, as you will not be able yet a while to get them for yourself. So you are now going to London, David, with Mr. Quinnon, to begin the world on your own account. In short, you are provided for, observed the sister, and will please to do your duty. Though I quite understood... Uh, that the purpose of this announcement was to get rid of me, I have no distinct remembrance whether it pleased or frightened me. My impression is that I was in a state of confusion about it, and oscillating between uh, the two points, touched neither. Nor had I much time for the clearing of my thoughts, as Mr. Quinnon was to go upon the morrow. Behold me on the morrow in a much worn, eh, little white hat, with a, eh, I don't know, black crepe, around it for my mother, a black jacket, and a pair of hard, stiff, corduroy trousers 
which Miss Murdstone considered the best armor for the legs that fight with the world which was now to come off. Behold me, so attired, with my little worldly all before me in a small trunk, sitting alone, lorn child, as parentheses as Miss Gummidge might have said, in the post-chase that was carrying Mr. Quinnon to the London coach at Yarmouth! See! 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 How our house and church are lessening in the distance. How the grave beneath the tree is blotted out by the intervening objects. How the spire points upwards from my old playground. No more. And the sky is empty. Well, let's uh, recap what happened in this chapter. Uh, Peggy gets fired after the uh, funeral, so that's pretty classy, the Murdstones. And then they just go on pretty much ignoring David, pretending like he's not there. And uh, then Peggy, before she's out, she says, uh, why don't you come to Yarmouth with me? And the Murdstones say, great, fine, get him out of here. So they go to Yarmouth, uh, where he gets to hang with Emily. And uh, after a little game of uh, cat and also cat, they uh, kind of flirt with each other a little bit, get a little more serious, a lot of arms around waists, a lot of, you're going to have a good day with me today, aren't you? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have a good day with you. And like, yeah, we're going to have a real good day. And while they're doing that, uh, Peggy marries Mr. Barkus, which is weird. Mr. Barkus spends most of that story just kind of showing up, floating around, being a little desperate, uh, kind of giving her a lot of gifts that don't mean anything. And then uh, somehow that's all really flattering. And then uh, when they get married, it's because they're going to go out on a picnic and they bring kids with them for some weird reason. As if that's to keep things safe and innocent. But they get married during this picnic. So that was weird. Uh, So after all that, uh, not much is said more about Emily to strengthen that bond. But then uh, he gets sent back to the Murdstone house where they just kind of ignore him some more. And just sort of, he floats around, he eats food, hangs out in his room, reads books, and that kind of thing. Gets to go back to uh, Peggy's new house with Barkus. Turns out he's kind of a miser. He's more rich than they really let on, but he he hides it. But she's got a little room for him and says, hey, I got your books here. And uh, your house will, this spot will always be yours. As if your childhood is locked in uh, some sort of stasis. And then, uh... The Murdstones, uh, when he hits them back, they, they arrange for him to take a job at the Counting House in London. I don't know exactly what that is, but uh, I'm sure we'll find out. And that's kind of how the story ended. Uh, what's good about this? Uh, yeah, it's a well-written story. I enjoy it so far. Uh, what sucks? Just David's life. Nothing ever good happens. Uh, he's lusting over that one kid. Uh, where you just can't stop talking about it. And then I was even saying, uh, boy, Emily's got to be getting jealous, and she kind of is getting jealous. She's sitting there with her cheeks all red. Oh, she's flushed. She's angry. Why is he talking about this boy all the time? Does does my boyfriend like men? It's confusing for her. Uh, boy, can't she? But then, uh, but he can never go back there again, and who knows? Maybe that'll, that'll be the last we'll see. I imagine if he's dropping this character as being so important to David, we're going to see him later in life. We already know he's a terrible person because if you're poor, he hates you. Uh, so this isn't really a good person to idolize. But uh, what do we learn? Eh, that everything sucks. Everyone you love will die or get married off. Uh, places that make you happy, like the boat in Yarmouth, you can't stay there all the time. You're going to have to suffer through life and cast your blood on the uh, of mortality on the stone of uh, this life so with that I guess we're pretty much done uh, I have a library in my house I snapped my sister said to me what do you got that dining room for and I said well because I, I own a house and I have a dining room with a dining room table and she said dining rooms are for suckers you're a man that wants a library. You've, you've got a globe on a stand. 
that you've I've had since the 90s, and I kept holding on to it, thinking one day I'll have a place to put this, and I never have had a place to put it. But so she said, uh, so why don't we turn your dining room into a library? So I bought giant bookshelves from Ikea and uh, got some chairs out there and some mood lighting and everything. I even got a little library table that I'm going to have set out there that I could do work on with my daughter and stuff. It's going to be cute. So I now have a library, and I also have a uh, uh, my, my living room. So I actually have a drawing room. And I have a library. So my actual physical home is turning into this bit that I do on my podcast. Well, with that, let's, uh, let's let this, uh, let's wrap this up and I will see you next week. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, nah, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. You can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, uh, along with episodes from Book Boys and uh, blah, blah, blah. You can also find me on Instagram, uh, which is uh, House Nuzzle. And conveniently enough, uh, Twitter, which is also at House Nuzzle. Annoyingly, YouTube made me pick a name instead of just a house nuzzle. So you got Glenn Nuzzles. So I guess you search for that if you want to watch a screen that doesn't do anything and just hear my voice. Uh, and since uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's got to be one left.